Welcome to a Verb Podcast. This is another episode of Moto Albums. I am your host, Brad Gebhardt. With me on the line, we've got none other than the motocross legend himself, Jeff Ennis. Mm-hmm. Jeff, how's it going? Uh, it's good. It's good to be on with you here. And uh, you know, like I said, we've met uh, a couple times before, but now to <clears throat> uh, take a look at some motocross history and take that walk down memory lane should be a good time. And hopefully the viewers uh, and the listeners have a good time with it. Absolutely, man. First of all, it is an absolute pleasure. You are motocross royalty. Uh, <laughs> the The era in which your career existed um, you might be one of the last guys that I can think of who actually might have competed at one point, in probably your youngest years on air cooled bikes. Well, I mean, like, like, w- like when you were on 50 60s, were they air cooled or are they still already? Yeah, looking- so the 80, 80, uh, 1980 might have been the last YZs that were air cooled, but 81. 82 maybe the 81 yz 60 it it wasn't even 65 then it was a 60 and then just before that it was a 50 even so yeah oh yeah i rode twin shocks air cooled drum brakes all that right on i went through i went through a, a really great uh evolution development period of dirt bikes really really pretty pretty fun you know yeah. I, I didn't really get to ride the quote works bikes like the some of the uh you know the works hondas in the 80s kind of come to mind as being the, the most handcrafted type of thing i mean i rode some stuff with yamaha when we were in uh, japan we rode some of the all japan nationals or a couple of supercrosses where uh bradshaw dubak and myself got to ride the 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 yamaha 250 ow works bike like leaf spring um fuel injection back in the days that fuel injection worked like shit back then (laughs) um leaf spring stuff like really weird stuff but on the production bikes going from twin shocks mono shock all of the early 80s when the manufacturers were trying to figure out linkages and 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 all those types of things um on a two-stroke engine when there was no exhaust valve power valve so I went through that whole thing. Uh, Yamaha's had these really cool uh, extension. Uh, it was a, they called it like a boost bottle was sort of the the slang for it. But from the carburetor on the on the rubber air boot that went from the carburetor to the reed block, the reed cage, right. um, you would have um, a, a hose coming off of that with like a, a, a you know a certain shape or certain size volume you know like a empty canister which which when the engine shut up when you shut off the throttle and the reed pedals would close that extra volume of fuel and air that was you know would would go up into that bottle and then the concept was that when you got back on the throttle the reed cage opens and it and it starts to vacuum um, all the air and fuel velocity from the carburetor. Then there was this extra bit that was stored in that That's bottle crazy. that then went through it. Oh yeah, weird stuff like that. So, um, you know, and then development of all kinds of parts. Being a factory racer and stuff, you, you go through a lot of the development. Now, what I did miss was really I missed the four strokes and I just just missed it um and really any real fuel injection like mapping and stuff like what you would call it now with with like efi and so i've actually this summer was the first time that i'd ever done any testing with mapping which is essentially like jetting in a two-stroke world um and i did that with jamie ellis from uh, twisted development when we're working on my on my 300 two-strokes so yeah, it's been fun, but you get to be my age, Brad. You're going to see a lot of shit, right? <laughs> no like, kidding. Yeah. Holy oh, yeah. fuck, man. Like, we, we, I, I told you this before we hit record on this. We could do, we could do one specifically just on the changes of the bikes that you saw from year to year to year, like right side up suspension, uh, the different cartridges, forks, and stuff like that. But right now, we're going to go through some photos. Uh, we're going to go me- down memory lane. Uh, if at some point, uh, you get tired of talking to me or uh, it's it's time for dinner. Just like log off the call and I'll, I'll take that as a hint. 
that uh, yeah. uh you're, you're done and connection uh, but, is lost yeah exactly you're, you're breaking up brad or maybe we're breaking up like uh but yeah no we'll, we'll go through some stuff and uh yeah we're, we'll break it up here this will be fun and uh I'm, I'm excited to chat with you about some stuff man because i'm a total moto nerd and i just i just i go nuts over this so the man the myth the legend that is jeff emig and honestly with more across this nations in the very in the, the not so distant future i'm gonna be in france in a week's time which just blows my mind because i haven't been off uh north america before um you are a three-time champion of this race uh first time going was 1992 uh i, I assume i guess you would have went twice on the yamaha and then uh, once on the kawasaki and pictured here uh racing the 500 um not a not a, a class that you actually wrote a lot of um but yeah take us first of all what's going on in this fi- this picture and let's talk some mx mxdm yeah so this would have been 1996 Lampson was on the 125, uh, 125 champion. Uh, McGrath was on the 250. He would have been a Supercross champion that year. Um, I was on the 500, uh, and and we had just recently uh, um, uh, McGrath and I had just battled that out for the for the 250 motocross championship. Um, and so this is the first time that I that I actually got to ride the 500 because the year before uh let's see i would have been yamaha and ryan hughes rode this bike um we just talked about this bike uh, last week at the la coliseum uh, kawasaki had a big uh champions and legends uh, celebration and this 500 gets brought up uh quite a bit um but this was the last time that this bike was raced and i say this bike because really this 500 hadn't changed a lot from around 1992. So the basic spec uh, was something that Jeff Ward would have ridden. And then Mike LaRocco and Mike Kudrowski would have, would have raced certain bikes, but this bike specifically was ridden a few times and saved for the next motocross of nation. So I believe this is, I, I believe that this is the same actual race bike that Ryan Hughes rode the year before in Slovakia. That's interesting. And maybe the year before, I think, uh, God, who rode in 93? Kudrowski or LaRocco rode the 500, one of the two. Yeah. So I, I, I'm thinking this bike was, you know, three or four years old. And what they would do is if there was a new, like physical, like shock spec or something new, they would throw it on there. If there was a new spec for forks, they would throw it on there. And there was a practice bike slash test bike. And then there was the race bike. And so, but this was it. This was the end of the era for the 500 because the next year would have been uh, Lamson, Dowd, myself. And I rode, I rode a 252 stroke. That's when they, right. they turned the 500 class into, you know, maybe they called it MX3 or open or something at the time. Yeah. And, where there still were at, like the open class, you saw like a lot of big displacement four strokes at the time. Uh, some yeah. of the Vertimatis that you'd see even, uh, some of the more exotic bikes, but yeah, it, it got to the point where, uh, you guys all th- like the two premier uh, level guys, you'd be better served just riding a 252 stroke. Um, cause actually it was at this event where if I'm not mistaken, Steve Lampson goes out and, and wins the 125 versus 500 race uh, on a 125. Is that not correct? Yeah, now I need to need to sort of put that into perspective. Um, that day, like I, I I felt that I had all of the 500 guys covered, right. and there really was this brewing battle between AMA and FIM, like there always was, and yeah. who's the best 125 rider in the world? Is it Lamson or is it Tortelli? And knowing sort sort of we we really were teed up to have a a great event and i remember talking to lamson and going hey look if you and tortelli are going at it like i'm not gonna i'm not i'm not gonna battle for the win like it doesn't like there wasn't i wasn't i had just literally gone through the toughest battle of my entire career the week before or whatever it was at steel city with with jeremy and so now at this point it was like hey you know, whatever. And I was, I was, if I remember correctly, I probably qualified first on this bike and 
my memory is that I didn't really have a lot of competition on it for whatever reason. And I don't want to disrespect any of my competitors or whatever, but that's just how I remember it. I could be right. completely wrong. I need to need to throw out the caveat with something like this, that, that, you know, this has been a number of years and, and I could be completely, you know, I don't know, but that's how I remember it at this point. So that, that's what we're going to go with. Um, and, and sure as shit, like I'm out front, uh, having a, a a fairly easy race if i remember correctly there might have been a a pretty decent first turn pile up or something mm -hmm. that that it sort was. of made made life even easier and i was just kind of cruising out front and then here comes lamson and tortelli and i could see them on the track and i was like oh shit these guys are throwing down like it's like they're going after it and and it's crazy because there are times that I can remember, and this is a moto that was just like that. You're kind of riding and racing subconsciously while like I'm doing my own race, but, and I'm doing that subconsciously. My mind, my conscious mind is watching what's happening with, with Lamson and Tortelli, like watching them around the track and then they catch me. And then it's like both go by and I'm like, okay, I want to keep up with them so I can watch the finish essentially yeah 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 you're almost a spectator in the race <laughs> yeah 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 i'm a yeah i'm an active spectator so but it was great um i mean i had this is probably a clip from that uh shot that that a lot of people talk about it seems to be infamous where i'm jumping over a guy on the downhill quad and people ask me about that all the time like right and they seem it's like they think that i'm the only guy that jumped this thing like it was some crazy <laughs> jump that i could only do on the 500 trust me i wasn't the only guy jumping it and it was scary as shit on this bike because you could over jump it or you could under jump it really easily so i was talking about that i would lug the engine i would i would like upshift to where i didn't have a lot of snap in the throttle right. and i would just kind of lug the bike off it so i get this great photo meanwhile you know, McGrath and Lampson are like jumping this downhill quad, like this whipping it, you know, McGrath doing knack knacks, Lampson's like whipping it so hard that, and, and I'm just going off of it, like, like full dead sailor. And I end up with this great photo. So that's, yeah, but it yeah. was a great day. We really cleaned up. Um, Eric Johnson at racer X once wrote about <clears throat> how he compared the uh, uh, 84, um, Team USA win at Major Park to this and the number of champions in the race and all this sort of stuff. Um, I just don't remember it being that difficult. I, I mean, maybe it was, but just in my mind, it was kind of a cruise control day. Yeah, I mean, you guys took care of business. And I, I think the the lore of this photo, and this is why I picked this photo to begin with, is, is that um, like you as well as I know now in today's media, like the photos from this weekend's the next weekend's more across the nations. Like they are so disposable in the fact that there's going to be millions of them. They're going to circulate around the internet for about a week. And then it'll be on to pictures of, of Chase Sexton on a KTM and this, that, and everything. Whereas photos like this, like this was, I think it was, it was an MXA uh, photo and, or possibly a, uh, uh, in cycle news and these photos were, there was maybe one of like 50 photos from that particular weekend. And it just immediately lives in infamy. Like people would pour over these, like a monthly publication, like you'd have it in your bathroom and you'd flip through it a 50,000 times um, and looking at stuff like this. And yeah, like I've ridden a KX 500 jumping one is like jumping uh, like, uh, like a, a dump truck. Those things don't, they don't, oh, yeah, don't Volkswagen. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they fly like uh, like a cinder block and uh, yeah, you, like that's probably what makes this thing more impressive. Um, but one of the things I love about more across this nation is something you still see to this day. It's maybe the only race all year where you get to see more of it is the custom paint jobs. And you always had some of the best custom painted helmets in throughout the nineties. In fact, I have one of the helmets here. Uh, maybe I'll go run and get it in a minute that, uh, one of my helmets, uh, that I had painted is sort of inspired by, uh, some one of the looks that you had. So th this was a good helmet as well. Yeah. That's something that we lived through that that era now everybody has uh helmet uh sponsors where they want that graphic to sell that helmet or more than likely on the pro level they they have um you know an energy drink sponsor that they've taken over that space and 
right. it's certainly made the helmet uh, space a hell of a lot more valuable to the athlete than what it was before. But in these eras, uh, every one of my motocross of nations helmets, whether it was a showy or whether it was a Fox, um, was done by uh, Troy Lee Designs, and 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 Troy always had just a great way of of you know capturing that. And my my first helmets were really that blue and white uh, victory design. And even though you can't see it in this helmet, it just kept getting crazier and crazier. The V was still in there, but he just changed it up um, so much. So I I believe I still have all of these. I don't know. I've got a storage unit just full of all kinds of memorabilia that uh, I need to bust out and I need to get it out there in the world because it doesn't do any good sitting around where it is right now. But uh, I, I believe that I still have this helmet. Yeah, and, and always a showy guy. Uh, right up until you're wearing uh, the fox lids at the very end. Um, what was the the connection there? Like, you just like you ran them as an amateur, or what was the deal? No, I didn't actually. I actually rode. Uh, I was with uh, uh, maybe Bell and then uh, BFA, and for a couple of years in the late '80s, um, and I really wasn't happy with that at the time. I actually rode my very first Supercross was Anaheim. 1989 uh, I was still an amateur so I kind of did this this sort of pro-am thing um, um, I rode the my very first supercross wearing Jeremy Albrecht's showy that was a Troy Lee Designs painted showy I, I wasn't even in my own helmet I asked That's him if amazing. I could borrow it because I didn't want to wear my BFA <laughs> That's hilarious. So, and then after that we got a deal done and you know, eventually the replica with the bull and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it was a, it was a fun time and it added a lot of character. Um, you, you kind of express some of your personality through, through your helmet, some of the messaging and things like that, you know? So, yeah, it was great. That's awesome. What, what other memories do you, uh, do you have from 92 and 93 and the other years that you went to more press destinations? Cause there were, there was a lot of other, there was other years where, uh, you were called to be on that team on, on a lot of years, but uh, you did get six, six straight years. Yeah. yeah. I was really bummed that really, really bummed that in 98 uh, I, I had had sort of a hot and cold year um, <laughs> and uh, uh, was injured and didn't get selected and, and, and it breaking my thumb and, and just really disappointed that that streak ended. And it was like, Oh yeah, I'll be back again. And as it turns out, um, 97 would would be my last motocross of nations. So, motocross of nations a very emotional race. Um, the high the, the highest highs of winning for the first time in 1992 certainly was just uh, one of the greatest achievements of my career at that time. Where um, I rode a 125, Michael Rocco on the 250, Billy Lyles who was riding GPs rode the 500. Uh, Roy Jansen was a team manager. So for the first time in a while, Roger DeCoster wasn't team manager, and we were we were all kind of the B team, and we went halfway across the world to Western Australia to win in Manjimup. So, and the first time that you hoist the Chamberlain Trophy, especially as a 21 year old, yeah, uh, you're a kid at just, the time. Yeah, it was just it was just a highlight of my career, and and really um, is is 92 is when I really started to. Um, be known on the world stage and things like that so yeah it was great and the lowest of lows when we lost in 94 uh in Roggenberg, switzerland i literally cried after the race i, I just felt like I, I let everybody down i should have won i should have been the first 125 both motos and paul malin out of england had the day of days and he rode amazing he passed me both motos and i reeled him in a little bit at the end of each moto but he just he rode um, you know, the track was something that an Englishman like himself uh, was just very accustomed to. And I just, I was too cautious in the beginning of the races and he wasn't. And um, Mike and Mike um, struggled with, with, you know, being inside the top two or so. And that just really hurt our chances. And so, but I, I, I took it very personal because I felt like I was the fastest 125 rider in the world even though I didn't win the one to five championship here. Um, I felt like that I was the best guy and I, I felt like I let myself down. And by doing that, I let down our country and our team. And, and I just, I was like, Oh shit, man, after the race, the awards podium and all that stuff. And then I kind of went off 
on the side of the track overlooking this beautiful valley in Switzerland. And, and it just hit me like, oh, shit. I'm on the first team that didn't win it once we started winning. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I just took it really personal and, and um, vowed that the next year we would get it back, but we didn't get it back the next year either. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, it's uh, it, it's it's no small feat to win this ch this championship. Uh, this is at th at this time was maybe the most popular and most coveted this this uh, race has ever been throughout the '90s. The the level of of exposure and the the attention and and just like sort of the, the clashing of two worlds that it was. Like you had the the MXGPs that was like in still many people's eyes the preeminent championship. Then you had. Uh, like basically the other side of that coin where people say that the, the, the best racers in the world go to the U S and the best racers in the world are from the U S. Um, and like, it was a, it was a real clash of clans year after year after year. Uh, and you being part of that so many times, uh, had to have been a huge feather in your cap. And honestly, like I, I got to imagine that this race and the success that you had at this race sort of fed, um your career in throughout the 90s of just being able to have that confidence so i'm like i'm one of the baddest guys on a dirt bike period let alone just from the u.s well there definitely was an ama versus i uh, versus fim element to it mm -hmm. and it because we had won so much uh, that 13 straight that, that by the time we got to 92 93 you know in there into 94 it was us against the world and teams would be like, hey, we're out of it, so we don't give a shit. We are going after the American riders because they just – even if it's like, hey, even if you're riding for Italy, let's say, you ain't going to win it, but damn sure make sure that America doesn't win it again. And, like, you talk to guys like Stant and whatnot about how many years they kind of snuck by and lucked out or needed something to happen just – right to to win it and and it and that happened um you know our time finally came in 94 but it was it was nice to to win again in 96 and i'm really glad that i got a chance to ride this kx 500 at least once no kidding absolutely uh, like uh, to this day mike larocco is still the reigning 500 national champion even though he won the last time he would have won it is 95 i want to say they didn't run the 500 Four, national yeah 94 uh stopped running the 500 nationals after that year uh let's spin the clocks a little bit further back uh i pulled some pictures from uh, the amateur days there's the kx60 i think is that a 60 or is that an 80 no those are uh 80s the, those are 80s the left and left in the center yeah and then and a 125 then, uh, yeah 125 or 250 i can't tell but it was my last year at uh, loretta's yeah so first of yeah. all I love the 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 venting that you've you've done some customization work with the the the, the Loretta's bib, um, mm -hmm. yeah, cutting the holes out of there. You're rocking like both actually, uh, you and uh, uh, the gentleman sitting next to you running the hockey hair. Like that's that's the the shaggy looks that uh, hockey players are known for. Uh, the open faced okay. helmet. You ran that a lot during uh, your uh, amateur days, and uh, yeah, the, the uh, that's seven four seven as uh, as a three digit number on the uh, on the far right there. Yeah, so that picture on the far left, oh, that's got to be like eighty five, maybe, um, yeah. probably eighty five. And and uh, um, I ran the the Bell Mag three there for a long time. I I, I liked wearing the open face helmet. Um, I wore like a, a Scott Venturi during those days. And I mean, even, even before that, I, I rode, uh, before the mag came out, I used to wear an open face helmet. I wear a Jofa or the JT mouth guard thing. And, yeah. and, uh, I, I, I always, uh, I didn't like how having the full face on, it was hard to see out of it. And really Jeff Ward and I were the, were some of the last to wear any sort, you know, any sort of open face helmet. Um, and uh yeah. originally the, the the viewport of a, a full faced helmet was was not optimal like it was pretty tight right like the, it's not as open as yeah. it is now so like even in the, yeah. the showy on the one helmet there you can see that it's pretty tight and the the chin the nose piece actually comes up quite top, quite high yeah it did and and um you know but there were multiple times where I smashed my face had you know knocked a tooth out in 1978 wearing a 
open face helmet. I got a gnarly cut here under my mustache. Gnarly cut. I had to go to the hospital to get stitches. I cut my chin up uh, once or twice wearing an open face where I had to, had to get some stitches. But um, yeah, it's, I, I certainly wouldn't want to do that these days. The helmets are too good, and and knowing what I know about the testing, it's just. But that was that was that was the era. You know, yeah. You know? So you're always a, a team green Kawasaki kid for the, as far as I can remember, I don't know exactly what year you'd started on team green, but um, all of the photos that I've ever seen of you in amateurs, you're on a green bike. Um, like, and honestly, to this day, no, like I, I know you're on a Husky today, uh, but Jeff, you're a Cowie guy to me. <laughs> um, like th this yeah. was synonymous, uh, like the, uh, the 47 on a green Kawasaki and uh, lots of smiling, lots of winning as well. Yeah, so first off, we all kind of have that. Every every rider uh, champion, even my my heroes that rode rode multiple brands, you still have that brand that you really want to associate your heroes with. It's like Rick Johnson. Who do you associate it with? Honda. Yeah, he rode Yamaha also. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah but, and, and so did really well in way. Yamaha too. Yeah, 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 and so. You know, I, I rode, um, my first real sponsorship came from Yamaha's amateur program in 1980, right. from 60s to 80s. And then 84, I started with Team Green, went all the way uh, to 89. And then first year as a pro, I was with Factory Kawasaki. And then I went back to Yamaha and then back to Kawasaki. And, and then uh, even my race teams, I went to Yamaha and then back to Kawasaki. So it was really just Yamaha and Kawasaki for, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I rode Suzuki's and MR50 Honda and Italjet and stuff like that when I was a kid, you know, a few, a few different bikes, but from the point of where I, where I had some sort of sponsorship support, it was always Yamaha and Kawasaki. And I, and I, I feel like I always left on good terms and the companies, once the pendulum sort of swung back the other direction, um, it, there was an opportunity there with them. And then, you know, I eventually went to Husky in um, 2016 and I had a great relationship with, uh, with the entire, um, you know, Husky crew and uh, the KTM group. Uh, I ended my relationship with them in 2000, 2000, oh, I'm sorry, 20, uh, 2020, 21. And so currently not um, contracted by any, any manufacturer and the bike that i ride is not a husky even though it's white and black fair enough um <laughs> well like so like dude like I, I think you had great style honestly like you always had cool gear uh running the the over the over the the jersey chest protector sticker placement was always prime uh answer gear for the most part uh aside from a couple of the years where you wore different stuff uh, how did sponsorships work uh, back in the day? Like, were you sending out resumes from a super young age or, and, and how were these gears being brokered? In the team green days, they had a, a, a team deal with Scott goggles, bell helmets, answer gear and boots. Okay. And I remember this picture in the center. I remember when all of this gear showed up and they sent like gear for the entire year. And it was like this amazing, like a huge box full of gear. Christmas. Which, which, yeah. Oh, the greatest thing ever. Uh, I mean, just, just the greatest thing ever. And those little answer triangle stickers during that era, I'd put those things everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It was super fun. And gear during that time period was going through a lot of transition, a lot of color changes and stuff, you know, whereas 10 years before that hell guys might've still been wearing leather leathers. Now be, they became pants instead of leathers and, and what it would have been in the seventies, early yeah, 70s, probably. It, it's what like a lot of people don't know, or maybe they, they don't remember. Uh, it was not uncommon throughout the seventies that you basically wore like racing leathers that you would have probably commissioned to like a local leather shop or, or there's different manufacturers that had them. And then the Jersey was, uh, was, was the, the manufacturer you wore like it was Kawasaki, Suzuki, whichever. Like, it was yeah. actually the only brand that really came out that, uh, aside, aside from Thorsten Hallman, was, was Fox. And like the story goes from them, they only really made the gear to, uh, to like let everyone know what shocks they were running because like a little sticker on the side of a shock doesn't, uh, doesn't advertise as well as, uh, the guys running the gear. And all of a sudden, people just started asking for the gear more than they're asking for the socks and a company's board. 
uh, one yeah. thing for, for yeah. a really and, long and, period of time. And then by, yeah, and then by the late 70s is when JT Racing right. started going. And, I mean, there's that great photo from probably 81 or so, 82, 83, where, where I mean, almost everybody who was anybody – was in a line from the Kawasaki guys, the Yamaha guys, Honda, uh, Suzuki, they were all wearing JT. Um, and then, and then it was, uh, probably around 83 or so was when Fox racing brought, um, they had, uh, uh, Mark Barnett, um, uh, Rick Johnson, uh, Pete Fox started designing gear in like, 85 or 86 while he was still in high school and and uh and then fox really started to to put a dent into what they were doing axo um and all the guys kenny and Ever, all the guys there just started doing great work and and now it's like i mean look we have like 50 brands now you know so yeah and uh, one of the things that is like, sort of interesting and you were part of that swing throughout the the, the 90s especially with shift is that back in the day, um, because of like traditional media and, and so much print, um, they, there was a lot of investment into like really eye-catching, like iconic ads, like gear ads, whether it was uh, like you had the, the GI look with the black and the, and the, the, the camel pants uh, from 1997. Uh, whereas now um, the, the approach is basically to come out with like a limited edition on a weekend uh they do that like fox does that four or five times a year and that's what drives people to the website maybe maybe more maybe more. yeah you know what i mean yeah they honestly they probably do it almost monthly um and that's what gets you to the website and maybe that stuff's sold out or maybe it's not available but at least you've come to the website and you're gonna buy something right like that's the whole idea behind it so uh it's kind of interesting to see it because like i think of like see like uh rick johnson with like the thinker pose back in the day like that was huge or uh doug henry's like the the scar photo like that stuff that lives in infamy, you just don't have that stuff anymore. But it's yeah, amazing. and that really was the intuition and the bravery that um, that I do believe that Pete Fox, you know, drove through the Fox brand. I'm sure that he drove his older brother Greg Nuts. and his dad Jeff and whoever else was running the company. He probably drove them nuts with these ideas where where um you, you know when you're trying to build this company and if a, a designer has this vision and especially pete he's the, he's the biggest fan advocate of motocross still it's like he watches every second of every lap of every race comments on it all the time on his social media um but he just had this vision and this style um that was really bold and fearless and like Rick Johnson and the thinker ad and things like that were just great. Um, he was not a part of the, the Rick Johnson Oakley ad with the, um, the yeah. sort of zebra sort of paint, which was just, which was great because Another great one. Yeah. Um, but Rick Johnson was the right personality for that. And it's, it's like you saw, I mean, the good example is, is, with shift in the mid to late nineties, well, late nineties, I guess it was, things were pretty crazy uh, in general. You know, we do the hot tub ad and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, private jets and all kinds of like, craziness. And then some years later, they tried to duplicate that with Brock Hepler as a shift rider, like in a limousine with a bunch of big boob women. And it's like, and yeah. Brock Hepler's like he wouldn't know what to do with any of them. He's not. The, he wasn't the right subject for that. Uh, right. I I wasn't on board with that. I was with Shift at the time as a consultant, and I'm just like, that's not. It has to be authentic to the person. And so, so many of these ads, uh, um, you really you can't. You, you know, you just can't take one idea and put it on any one of your athletes. It really has to line up. And I think that that's where the magic of some of that great marketing builds the athlete's image, the brand's image and creates something that we are attracted to. And it's like, that brand's cool. That's what I want to be about. And then also it really, the authenticity comes when that's the lifestyle too. And sure. if you know, if you knew Rick Johnson, know him, like, like he still is a bad boy, right? The original bad boy to him. I mean, 
he's like the funniest dude you'll ever get on a podcast. He's just, you know, he's so incredible to be around. Um, and so he was open to those ideas. The, the JT ads where he had like the, what the bird and stuff, like all that sort of, you know, it's just, yeah, it was really cool. And so, um, in a, you could make a big impression in those days because I mean, you used to see an ad, like that's what you had to do. You had to produce a two page ad and a catalog. And nowadays you're going to put all this effort into that Instagram post, the same amount of effort and it's gone in a day. Yeah. You know? Everything's so disposable. We, we look at it, it honestly it breaks my heart. Because... Oh, that was cool. And then we swipe. Yeah. And so that's the thing right now is the attention span of everyone. And I, you can't just say young people. It's like no, everyone. everyone, we all, we all just flick through it so fast. And it's so unfortunate because it's really difficult to capture people's um, attention that way. Um, gear brands, uh, there's doing, making good solid gear is fairly easy these days. It's not like it used to be. The pants had an incredible amount of, uh, research and development put into them, helmets and stuff. And you can, nowadays, you can just send something to the factory in China or, and go, hey, just duplicate this and they can make it almost the exact same and you didn't do any, you didn't design it. Yeah, no, it's completely changed. And yeah, like you're, you're totally right. The, um, And that's, I think, really what made monsters of you guys. Like you lived in such an era where print and like, like, I, up, me being up here in Canada, like I got at best 24 magazines a year. That's all I get. I got one live Supercross and otherwise like there wasn't, there wasn't YouTube. There was none of like that. Uh, I had no opportunities to, to check that stuff out. So any piece of like any iconic um, ad, like I was, I was, I was looking at it over and over and reanalyzing it. And that's why I look at these photos like this one right here. Uh, first of all, pulling an awesome whole shot. Is this the, is this the Unijet? Uh, car no, on not, the Yamaha? Not, not yet. Not yet. This is not yet. This is uh, 91. Yeah. And this is during the Outdoor Motocross Championship. You've got Kudrowski. You almost who, won the Supercross Championship. Who was, yeah, yeah. Three yeah, points. McGrath and I were really close. Yeah. So Kudrowski on the number four Kawasaki. Um, you've got, it looks like uh, uh, Guy Cooper, Mike Brown tucked just behind him and Doug Henry. Um, not sure what this. 125 might be McGrath or Buell or somebody. It's hard to say exactly what number's on there. Um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you what race this is from, maybe Steel City or someplace. But this was the time of year where, especially with motocross riding, is that in the 125 championship, I started to separate myself from the other 125 supercross riders and started to become – of of us that were on what, what they called a pro-am license and would be riding 125 full time i was i was becoming the consistently the top finisher because you got to remember at that time you had uh kudrowski cooper and these guys would ride 250 supercross so they were they were like the sort of premier riders that were riding the smaller displacement in motocross and i i won a moto that year i i i, I really started to get myself between Cooper and uh, Kudrowski and some of the veteran guys uh, uh, pretty consistently at the end of the year. And I remember I, I won Bud's or, or I went two two at Bud's Creek one year and I thought I won the overall and Keith McCarty is like, hold on, settle down because Kudrowski three, and Cooper went three, one and one, two, and they each got the extra point. And I'm like, I got it. And they're like, no, nah. no, you got third. I'm like shit. Yeah, two two for third. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a number of guys that have had that fate. That's not yeah. no fun whatsoever. Uh, but yeah, you get that extra point for winning. I had to put this photo in there. I love this gear. This they, they brought the yeah, Thor brought this back. Uh, oh, four or five years, maybe three or four years ago now. Uh, it's a great look. This is another awesome uh, paint job uh, on the helmet, and uh, one of the only years that we saw you in CD boots. Yeah, not uh, ninety one. Um... Yeah, and I had a, I don't know how I acquired a, a black pair of CDs, but they I only had these blue ones and then white ones, and they wouldn't give me black ones. So I had this black pair that I would wear uh, only on special occasions. I would save them because I probably bought them or something. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, 
the amount of colors going on in this photo is epic by the way like this is so yeah. 1991 it fucking hurts man <laughs> oh yeah well wait hey wait to see what i have going with we big moto right now I, I, we had a little a little uh sampler when i rode the vet um 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 world vets at farley castle last month uh i have this i have uh, a full set of retro gear there's gonna be two different jerseys so did so two different designs mm -hmm. um it's full it's as 90s as it gets so we're, we're having some fun with it so that'll be available soon is the the wee big Todd Covey uh Kobe Correct. um is it Kobe or yep. Covey? Todd Covey, yeah. Todd Covey, is that a connection through Fox from back in the day? Because I know he used to do some design work for Fox, or is that? Yeah, Todd was one of the lead designers at Fox. He was he was like the crazy mad scientist designer uh, that never was necessarily out front. Yeah. But Todd Todd was one of like. Todd and Pete Fox were designing all of the shift product and, and ads and all that stuff back in the early days of shift and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Todd's fantastic, fantastic designer. Um, I was having a conversation the other night at the Alpine stars um, 60th anniversary uh, event with uh, Jerome Maj and David Durham. Um, you, you probably know Durham's name yeah. from Fox and Alpine star and all this sort of stuff. He's with Thor um david is just absolutely brilliant jerome maj is equally as brilliant we were talking about okay who is like like who are the greatest motocross gear designers of all time and and so we're having some cocktails and we're talking about todd and 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 it was like you know what todd may be the craziest and most brilliant he, he may be too crazy or he may be absolutely brilliant it's kind of on that fine line right uh, but yeah, they, they all have a tremendous love and respect for each other, even though they're all kind of working in the same, uh, in the, in the, in the same arena, but yeah, so we'll, we'll see Todd's got a lot, a lot of great ideas for we big. And what we're doing now is we've created, um, he's done some retro gear that is sort of a 1985 build, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and the stuff that I wore at Loretta's and at Farley and going forward is a sort of a modern cut, um, if you will, with all the proper stretch and fit and all that stuff that modern racewear would have. And so we're going to, we're going to have some fun with it. It's going to be very limited, very boutique and niche and, and, uh, knowing Todd, it's going to be fucking crazy. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, I, I had actually so out him on this it. podcast. I would love okay to like i know all of the the designs that todd came up with that actually made it i would love to see his notebook full of of stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor because you know there's some outlandish things that he brought to the table that someone like that either peed or someone at fox said no to uh the guy's yeah. not yeah he's a design genius yeah so. so what's what's interesting though about this is, is i rode for thor for 10 years yep um i had a deal with jt lined up going into the 87 season okay uh, my last year on uh, mini bikes and the deal fell through like 11th hour. Why? Uh, I don't remember exactly why, but it went sour. And so this Torsten Hallman brand called and just about two months before that, they had, um, they had just hired Jim Gallagher as lead designer, young guy at the time, older than me, of course, but um Bob Maynard was probably had just taken over as president of the company. I don't think that they had been purchased by Parts Unlimited at the time. I think it was still, I think Torsten still owned the, yeah, owned the company. They didn't get purchased um, not, until 1997. Okay. So, so yeah. So during that time, and I formed a great relationship with Jim Gallagher and Jim and I, you, you know, w we did 10 years together. This to 135 Supercross, I'm sorry, 125 Motocross Champion, Motocross of Nations stuff, all the fast boys and all that sort of stuff. We went from from Hallman Racing to Torsten Hallman Original Racewear all the way through. Um, and what was great, I still have the pants. Um, in 1996, at the last national, uh, the race where MC and I had the Battle Royale, I wore a set of pants and my and my my butt logo was the zeppelin four logo with all the four symbols and it said 10 years gone okay jim gallagher was a drummer so he was a rock drummer before okay. he became a designer yep. 
and and his band they played all kinds of zeppelin and stuff and his best song like his favorite zeppelin song to play was 10 years gone well we didn't know at the time uh but it it was uh kind of what fortuitous is that the word i'm looking for here that yes that this that uh, not long after that would be when i accepted the deal with shift and i'd be leaving thor after 10 years and so i still have these pants it's really important to me and jim and our relationship uh cool. it just it was like this 10 years gone vibe it's like wow like that's how it lined up and and actually i seen jim uh, earlier this year at uh, parts unlimited so in louisville uh, kentucky i seen him at the airport and we got a chance to catch up and it's like oh how's your you know your oldest kid now and it's like 35 and it's like wait what he was just like 11 and yeah. it's like no 20 25 years or so has gone by and um so it's still great to catch up with them and jim did a great job of of being lead designer then head of design at thor and really is responsible for giving guys like david durham and, and a number of other great designers uh their opportunity and stuff so lots of lots of great memories um didn't leave thor on great terms it was a it was kind of a tumultuous uh you know contract negotiation where this new brand shift and axo and thor and i was sort of right on the cusp of 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 possibly winning a supercross title and and so we made it all the way to the 250 motocross championship celebrated a lot of great wins and and a lot of good stuff so i'm thankful that uh, that we had those 10 10 great years with thor yeah and and that last race uh aside from like the obviously you go uh over season and race uh another race for thor at more crosses nations that year um yeah maybe, maybe would what would go down as one of your best days on a dirt bike period um with the really clutch performance at the tail end of the 96 season wearing thor uh and we're gonna get mm -hmm. to that a little bit later on uh and like like i said i i told you we were gonna go long we're down when you're down near an hour into this thing uh so uh we'll keep going along here uh kawasaki days still in thor um like great looking stuff honestly you had some really good looking uh gear uh and then if i'm not mistaken this was also your last year in scott goggles before you'd wear an arnett for a good portion of your career as well yeah so that that picture on the left i probably have an arnett sticker on my helmet i'm wearing scott goggles because um arnett glasses were founded by greg arnett who was a former um factory uh, mechanic um, got into the eyewear business um and and i don't remember exactly where the connection was and i remember talking to bevo who who was with scott for decades and I said, hey, I want to be allowed to have a separate sunglass contract separate from goggles. And I said, it's just a sunglass contract, like not goggles. And he goes, dude, Greg's going to make goggles eventually. No, 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 it's okay, be real young. But I mean, it probably paid me an extra 5000 or 25000 Who knows at the time, yeah. you know, and Arnett sunglasses were like the coolest shit ever the early 90s mid 90s yeah. the chrome ravens and all this stuff and and it was it was great you know i mean i was with scott for 15 years or something i mean just a wonderful relationship but then arnett was able to offer me a ton of money uh to develop the goggle and go that direction and so that's that's where the business went and and a lot of my, I, I developed a lot of really strong friendships with the people at our net, uh, Mike Parsons in, you know, you know, in, uh, you know, in a particular, uh, I don't remember exactly what his job was in sports marketing, but Mark, Mike is a, a pro surfer, legendary big wave surfer, and really taught me to surf. We started hanging out, became really close. And I just gravitated towards that vibe with our net. And Bevo seeing the writing on the wall and, and eventually uh, 97 is when I signed the deal to launch the new Arnett goggles. Yeah. 97 saw a lot of change for you. Uh, new gear, new goggles and, uh, and a new number that you would take on to, uh, to a pair of championships uh, that particular year. But this was good stuff. Like this was a good looking bike. Uh, what I love about this era still is that essentially the graphics that you raced with were not totally indifferent 
from what Kawasaki's came with that particular year, even the year prior to this, you're essentially running like a very stock looking Yamaha. Like you're not even, you don't even have arches on the, the fenders. This is just a Bell Ray sticker in the front. And I would also question whether or not they actually used Bell Ray in your bike. Uh, it was probably maximum. I think no, I think we did at that point. We we, okay. we switched to like casserole or something the next year. But yeah, you know the significance. Uh, I don't recognize the picture on the left. Uh, obviously, the picture in the center is Steel City, nineteen ninety six. Um, this is Bercy. That's Bercy on the end, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, the one on the right is going to be. It uh, appears to be St. Louis, nineteen ninety seven. That's right. That's St. Louis. That, You're right. Yeah. That. Or I'm sorry, nineteen ninety six. I have that great you know, massive smile on my face. So, um, we know why, you know, both of those races, uh, were just incredible. Um, I think the fact that my adversary was Jeremy McGrath and the, the level that he was at, uh, especially during that time period, especially in Supercross, uh, and to be able to nab a win and then eventually a championship. Um, and, and he was basically second in both of those, was very validating um and you know I, I i wish i could have nabbed more supercross titles but that's the way that it went you know more more wins things like that right. but the steel city 1996 was was really uh, it was such um such a meaningful race to me to because that summer that year i i was knocking on the door i was chasing jeremy down i was getting closer there'd be races i mean i i got to start most of the time there were multiple supercrosses where i kind of handed the win to him by by my own mistakes not not saying that mm -hmm. like i would mess up and he'd take the win and it just became so frustrating and so what built inside me was just this desire and this determination first off to to stop him from winning every supercross right we all were trying that night in St. Louis, every the stars aligned and I got the job done and I didn't make any mistakes. Um, and then in the motocross championship that year, I mean, it came down to the, the final two motos and it was just absolute tug of war. And if you watch the very first lap of Steel City 96, he passes me over the big double in the pro section. And then I square him back up and go around the outside of him and just bonsai this jump. And at that point that one point is when we both knew that i was going to do whatever it took to win the championship and i kept him behind me the entire rest of the day so we're talking the entire first moto the entire second moto i was totally in control i knew where he was at and i was going to do whatever it took to win and and i, I ended up winning both motos that day and it just was such such an incredible victory for myself and kawasaki and and Jeremy Albrecht, my mechanic and our team and my trainer, John Hall and my, my family, everybody around me, that was, it was just such a momentous victory for us uh, that, yeah, there's a lot of great memories come out of that, that day. Certainly. Uh, you, you, you tackled the giant that day and, and came out on top and it was like, there was never in question. Uh, I've gone back and watched that race. I honestly probably watched it every six months or so, just because I like I I I I literally have a terabyte of old races, and and that one gets uh, more than a few plays. Um, one thing that we'll get into, I think it's, I think it's the next slide is um, everyone always talks about how your black gear, it, the the ship the shift stuff was was hot, and you were like a badass wearing uh, the 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 black gear. All dollars like dollars to donuts. This Thor gear is hotter and heavier. Because I had one of these jerseys and these one of these like these jerseys, those were full blown cotton. They're like the like the um, Yeah, the gear on the right. Yeah, the gear on the right is was super terrible. hot. Yeah, like, it was all printed. It was all yeah. printed, so it didn't vent. Yeah, no. that was terrible. Like a mock, like a mock neck on it. Everything that you wouldn't do these days. Um, but Jim Gallagher wanted to make me tough. He wanted to he wanted <laughs> to part of the year design. after year uh, make me work harder. So I appreciate that, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it did not breathe. Ooh, 1990. Oh yeah, I I, 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 I may have mixed these up a little bit when when putting them together. This probably Sorry. should have came uh, earlier, but uh, yeah, like 90 on the Cowies. This is a good look, man. Like honestly, you always had you always had uh, good looking stuff throughout, but like Thor with the the blue the blue bib is that uh like what was the blue bib for? 
So it doesn't get recognized until 1992. Okay. But in 1990, we had the first 125 shootout. Okay. Okay. I won that event at LA Coliseum. Um, and then won again the next year yeah. uh, on Yamaha. The Dave Coombs Senior Memorial 125 showdown, right. for whatever reason, only goes back to 92. Okay. So I don't know what the deal was there. I don't know why they don't want to recognize these first two years, but that's what the bib would show. The blue was probably for West Coast. So it was East Coast, West Coast type of thing. Okay. The the helmet with the go- the the pink goggles is a look. That is strong head to toe. The white C yeah. like yeah. well, and remember, is, yeah. I think they gave us those showy helmets like the week before. And that was some like Troy Lee showy thing look it, there's not even any like sponsor logos on it it's like they gave it to us for that race yeah yeah it's a cotton jersey with printed stuff very like like a like a like a long sleeve t-shirt printed yes. now the one on the right was this crazy 90s uh i don't even remember what they Checker called flag. it the checkerboard and all that yeah. the checkerboard it was very 90s yeah jim was is that matasevich behind you yeah, yeah jim gallagher is. was on some hallucinogens uh, th- that th- during that time, and Troy Lee it. Spider Web, yeah, uh, it's crazy. I love this. Like this picture, like in this picture next to you here, th- that's one hundred percent chicken. Uh, yeah. like looking up at the probably a video board that's not actually there because video boards didn't exist yet. Uh, the great looking showy helmet. Who's uh, who's standing next to you? Who's uh, who's like, giving oh, so you? That's some... my dad. That's your old man. All that's right, my cool. dad. Yeah, just like on the eighty five picture yeah. or the or the nineteen eighty or the when I was on eighties. Mm-hmm. um this is my father he was my mechanic first year as a factory rider so guys like myself michael rocco denny stevenson um our dads weren't really ready to cut the cord and thankfully because once revived cowie the factory bike was pretty shitty and if you notice this is um first race a year first motocross of the season in gainesville florida at okay. gatorback so chicken would have been on the line for the 125 class and it was crazy because we would we would do a lot of testing and stuff with factory Kawasaki, but their engines totally suck. Okay. Yeah. So my dad, my dad, who was an engine builder and a fantastic engine builder at the time. Uh, so we had box vans back then. Mm-hmm. Okay. So my dad would do his own modifications and we would ride an engine that wasn't the approved factory Kawasaki engine. And any of the spare parts and any of that stuff, he literally kept at the hotel or in the cab of the box van or whatever, because, you know, he, Roy Turner was a team manager. He knew that we weren't on the up and up, but my dad's like, I'm building engines. So Jeff Emmy can be successful. I'm not building engines for Jeff Matasevich in his story, like unapologetic, like, sorry. Yeah. Jerry Campbell was uh, was a chicken chicken's uh, mechanic then, and it was just super like sketch and like amateurish and you know not professional. But my dad was like, "Sorry, ain't happening. I'm not building anything for chicken. I'm only building it for my son." And thankfully, because we had fantastic bikes, fantastic engines, um, yeah, and that's just the way it went. That's how it was. You were national number eighteen this year, did you not? I earned earned eighteen for nine. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, like that's sick as a pro am rider. Um, and yeah, like yeah, your your dad, of course, and then the year two years after that, the Unijet carb that this like that goes down into motor cross the mono-jet, yeah. yeah, the monojet, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah and, the, and the thing about the yeah, and the thing about the number is is that your your national pro points that went towards a national number because uh, it changed every year in one two five supercross those points didn't count yes it was only nationals it was only one two five nationals which uh were it was separate for one two five supercross you had a pro-am license and for the nationals it was a different thing and then of course 250 supercross and and 500s and 250s outdoors all that counted towards your national number so it was just a weird thing how the 90s were um that's just how it how it was so yeah, and I actually just released a video essentially talking about how numbers get earned nowadays and permanent numbers. And like it's actually crazy to think because when they first introduced the permanent number system, 
uh, in, I believe it was 2000, essentially how yeah. it went was um, like it was in order to get a permanent number going forward, you had to be, you have to be top, top 10 in overall points. And that's still that way now, or if you're going to win a championship, whether it's the a 450 championship. No, it or wasn't the not champion. top 10 in points. You, you top the uh, single digit numbers only went to champions. champions. Right. But I dug so it. If, yeah, you, if you won your first, yeah. yeah. If you won your first championship, uh, then you could pick whatever number you wanted. Uh, nobody else could pick a single digit number. And I, I think it's kind of immaterial these days. And, guys that you know we all kind of we're still in this vibe of having the low number meant something and nowadays like you know you 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 know you have your sort of branded number like what like what um reed was 22 rocks and being 94 things yeah. like that and yeah and that that makes more sense for those things to jump around or to have a branded number but but then how do you like where you know like the seniority comes in into play of of who gets to pick what number and things. So uh, I thought it was a really cool part of motocross history when, when, you know, the, the, you earn those numbers and your number changed every year. I thought it was something cool, but then it kind of ran its course where the value of having a branded number became greater than what this, this system of, of renewing your number every year based on the amount of championship points that you earned came into play. So it's just kind of end of an era. Certainly. Absolutely. And, and nowadays, like in order to get a, a two digit, like a permanent two digit number, you have to be top 10 in points. But I think year over year, if you look at least probably eight of those top 10 guys already have a permanent number. So there's usually only one or two guys every year that are yeah. choosing a number. And since the fact that we have like a number of guys that just hang on to their numbers forever, although Chad's going to lose his 22 this year. Uh, like at one point, I think the, 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 highest number that wasn't already given to someone was like 29 or 30 or something like that um yep. but uh yeah it's always interesting to look at so this is oh this is my one of my favorite eras uh this is when i start uh paying attention to the sport this is my wheelhouse uh the, how high you got your leg in this photo is one of my favorite things I, i've like i used to trace this out on uh, as a kid uh, like <clears throat> over and over and over again i love this photo I, if i can't actually remember where that where that's at but the black pants still, still the white city jersey, 97 yep. that's steel city 97 yep. um deep ass rut that you're uh you're riding through right there take me through these photos yeah, was, and yeah the, obviously the emmy goes in the bit in the middle which is near and dear to my heart because i still i like i my, i've made my girlfriend watch that movie my friend um so yeah go through these so yeah, if you start from the right, sort of chronologically, is Steel City, not Steel City, sorry, Glen Helen, That's 1997. Right. Uh, I really was firing on all cylinders. The bike was amazing. The gear looked badass. You just won My the Supercross Championship. All time high. Went to Steel or went to Glen Helen that day. McGrath was pretty quick. Albertine was fast. Um, um, but it's like I just was so dialed in that day. And, and, and I remember the second moto I won by quite a long ways. And I remember, you know, I, I, I typically didn't try to win races like then. I didn't like, go, okay, I'm just going to put it to them and, and just look at my lap times every lap. It was like, if you got out to a 10 second lead, you're going to back it down, be safe, know where second place is at, things like that. But it was it was super hot that day, and I remember um, the second moto. I raced pretty hard to the checkered flag, and I was and I wanted to hurry up and do the interview with Davey Coombs or whoever it was for ESPN. By I wanted to have my helmet off by the time Albertine came by in second uh, to kind of you know do that like head games type of thing. I don't I don't remember if I actually achieved that or not. I'd have to go back and look, but it was like I, I just really. I was everything, my flow, my confidence, the bike was just awesome that day. And Glen Helen was gnarly then. And, and this, this photo on the right, uh, somebody at motocross action got that. I don't remember the name of who took the photo. Um, Is it a Fred Coon photo? I don't think so. But some years ago, um, my, my ex-wife had this photo blown up. So I actually have this in my house, a huge, three by five foot um, um, photo of this on the foam core. I love it. And then she sent the slide back to MXA and 
somebody lost it. So that slide never got digitized. So it's gone forever. So, wow. In like in <laughs> any type of high of my, res. Wow. That's cool. No, no. I mean, you can, I've got some copies of it that some guys have worked on. Um, but yeah. And then you fast forward to um, this is this when uh, Jeremy Albrecht and I are filming the Emigo, Emigos commercial for Fresno Smooth. This is at the entrance to Steel City. And we did this Saturday morning before the national and Amazing. I had already won the title. So everything was kind of chill. So we knock out the Amigos commercial and that whole craziness and they film Adam Barker and Troy Adamitis who, who uh, produced um, film directed everything shot uh, Fresno smooth. They were there that day and they actually got racing footage that's in the movie. J bone even put like the pit board out one lap in the second moto. This is like oats and brand and things like that so they we filmed a bunch of the Fresno smooth there that 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 weekend i had i had won the title the the week before at binghamton mm -hmm. and it was like okay i i completed it i'd done what i wanted to do i didn't even ride that week we literally went out to the lake and we were wakeboarding all all week long and then came to the final race and won both motos that's where this photo in the white jersey so that's basically the snow camel pant with a white jersey instead of black um and that photo a japanese photographer got it and i'm i think it was shin shintaro or uh what was his name it was in dirt cool if i remember correctly so i'd have to check and to to remember who act, who exactly got the photo but um yeah just kind of they had never ran the track down this little there was this little embankment and they ran it down the embankment and then you turned and went straight back up so it created this massive rut uh, that went through this and they just happened to catch that right at the right time. Yeah, no, that is, that is about as iconic as it gets. Both these looks, by the way, are cold as ice. Like this is, this mm -hmm. is a, this is a good look. The, the, the black Alpine stars, uh, the helmets on point. We already talked about the Arnett goggles, but like the Arnett sticker across the front of the visor, um, yeah, and like, uh, are those shift gloves or those, or, or are they fox gloves? No, they're shift gloves, green ones. We didn't yeah. have, we only had the uh, green, blue, and orange. Yep. Um, I always had bad luck in the orange, so I got like bad juju from it. Mm -hmm. Pete's like, hey, you got to run the orange sometime. And I'm like, I don't want to run the orange. Uh, it, you know, you have one bad race, and all of a sudden, it's I like, also it's never loved you color. in the orange gear. The the orange no, gear I from like I never liked it either. I, I don't know. The green looked good. Uh, and the black, this look was the, this was look good. Uh, was there not also a blue? Yeah, there was orange, blue, and green. Yeah, and then we did this snow camo, and and the jersey there was incredibly thick and hot. Mm -hmm. But we would, um, it was a free ride jersey essentially. But uh, I would wear a chest protector under it, so it would kind of push it away from my chest. Mm -hmm. You can't really see it, but the neck. When they would print the shift on the shoulder and the sponsor logos, they actually silk screen those and silk screen my name and number on the back. When they did that, it would stretch out the collar really far. So the collar would set and all of it would kind of set away from you. And so I actually got really good airflow down it. But, okay. but for me, it was totally mental wearing black on the hottest days uh, is, is that I just it was like a psychological thing that I, I I loved the gear and the look at the time, just wearing sort of black and white when everybody else had all kinds of different colors. So, yeah, it was yeah, cool. No, no, you're, this is a bad look. And uh, before we move on from j and like the two of you guys are two peas in the pod. Like I'm literally hearing this ad in my head while I'm looking at this. Um, like as far as mechanic rider relationship, um, this like this has to be top 10 in the whole sport, maybe top five. Like, this, this was special. Yeah, I mean, we had a, you know, yeah, we had such a great relationship and we were friends for a long time before he was my, my, uh, my uh, mechanic right. uh, at the end of 95. Um, when I joined Kawasaki, I asked Steve Butler, my mechanic at Yamaha, Yamaha to come over with me. Uh, he decided not to leave Yamaha, which I don't, I think he's still at Yamaha headed, headed up a research and development. I think so. Yeah. He's made a great he's made a great, uh, great uh, career. And that was obviously the right choice for Steve. And I was super bummed. Um, but cause Steve was the only mechanic that I'd ever had, uh, besides my dad. And so then I signed with Kawasaki and it's like, it's going to be Ron Wood. And then his dad gets sick or something. And so he says, he doesn't want to travel. 
and then it was uh there were like four uh, um Danny Bentley was on the list and then that didn't happen I mean Spencer Bloomer there was somebody else I can't think of um one thing led to another they all fell through and it's like well now there's literally nobody else on the list and so I suggested to Roy Turner, I said, well, what do you think about Jeremy Albrecht? He's working on Pedro Gonzalez's bikes at North County Yamaha. He's a good friend of mine. He's a quality mechanic. You know, he, he deserves a shot, if you will, at, to, you know, to, you know, to step up from being on a support level team to up to the, up to the factory team. And what was great is that Jeremy and I, we really took this journey together and it, it, we had such a good time along the way that it made it so memorable. And we, he allowed me to be me and whatever that meant, some good, some bad, but we, we just like, we worked hard and we, we played hard and, and you know, that we, we ran it pretty hard, burnt the candle at both ends. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I really let him down in 99 when, when, uh, shit went bad and, and I lost my ride with Kawasaki because that was kind of the end of our working, uh, relationship and the sort of end of, end of that era where we had just four amazing years, uh, together. Um, but the time that we did, he just, he, uh, it, that we did it together in that sort of writer mechanic relationship sort of team within the team thing was so strong and it was so really amazing to be able to 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 do the work and and experience to go on that journey with somebody that was one of my best friends and for us to share in 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 this that that way it was it was really pretty pretty awesome no doubt. You know, you guys uh, match each other quite well. I, I, I don't, I wonder, I, I wonder who gets more Fresno spru- smooth, like quotes yelled at them. Oh, he raced does. It. He, like, does, he, does he spat ass Jack and Cokes? Like that's all it is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, sure. I figured. And they're like, like what's wrong, Jeff? I don't know, man. Just don't feel like myself. You need some oats and bran. Uh, <laughs> I loved it. Uh, can't get out of this thing without talking about this, this ad right here. It's one of my favorites. Uh, we got, um, you're enjoying a nice glass of champagne with some young ladies. Um, you're holding on to a, is, is that the, is it the Supercross championship or is that, uh, that is, that is, yeah. yeah, that's, uh, so Supercross obviously in Vegas was Saturday night. This was Sunday night, uh, at the MGM hotel we had this big suite uh set up for this photo shoot this is another pete fox creation um um um, these were uh either friends or wives of of friends one of those was my girlfriend at the time uh they were all friends and so they all agreed to to do this shoot um while all the guys and everybody from stiff fox all that were inside the suite and just keeping the party going. If we were in it. Chris Holtner shot this photo. Yes. It took us like two hours to do it. Like that's that's probably not champagne in there anymore. It's just hot tub water getting poured back in there. So, Amazing. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. getting pruny. So, You're like, can we get this? Like, my abs are only yeah. gonna look like this this good for this long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, uh, uh, yeah, you got Michelle, Michelle, Monica. Lonnie and Jen. So, and the, on the far left is Rams uses ex-wife Amazing. and she wanted to be in the pick cause they're all, they were all friends and everything, but she was actually pregnant. So she's like, I can just oh, be in, I gotta be in up to the water level. Right. Fair so enough, yeah. she couldn't, you know, yeah. Yeah. So that's was, pretty uh, funny. Yeah. Uh, and it was just like, dude, we had like a hardly slept at all Saturday night. We had the awards banquet just before this. It was like, I was so tired. I just like, come on, Holtner, get the photo. Like how many different, I mean, they worked at it forever and ever. So we're out here quote working and all the guys are in the suite, right? Cocktailing it up, having a good time. Come on, we're going to go out. Let's go finish the shoot. And so it was, 
you know, art imitating life in, in a certain in a certain way. Yeah. But that was that was one of the things that I was open to these these sort of shocking, you know, uh sort of, you know, going like crossing the line a little bit with marketing and advertising and things like this. And I'm sure this isn't everyone's vision for what, how they want to advertise or market successes and victories and stuff like this. But for us, this is, this, this was it. And so people think of it as a very iconic uh, advertisement celebrating uh, a great victory. Absolutely. Yeah. This, this is right up there. And uh, before we leave this one, I just want to mention the fact that your Supercross championship trophy looks a lot cooler than the first. Sh- I, I can't imagine they weren't made out of plastic this last weekend uh, at the Super Motocross World, like, World Championship with like this, the SMX thing, like sort of embossed on there that like, I, I, I love World Su- like I love, I love Supercross and all that, but this is a much more like, this is like this, this trophy right here looks more like a trophy than what uh, Hayden Deegan had uh, was holding over his head uh, this last weekend. Yeah, it was, it was great. It, it really was uh, about the first, uh, maybe the first year for this era of trophies. They still give this style of trophy. Now they, mm-hmm. they dress it up a lot more. Um, one thing also about this ad is this was the racer X ad. So Davey Coombs yes. was like, hell yeah, I'll run this. Um, um, Jody Weissel and uh, Roland Hines, uh, editor and owner of Motocross Action, who was really the the rival, like it was Motocross Action Racer X at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, um, they would not run this ad. I'm shocked so by that. The other the other jackpot ad was me like standing next to a limousine or something like, yeah, it was not quite as effective. And nobody talks about the other one, but you know they yeah, had different I've values and different things. Yeah, that's um, hilarious. Going that point. I know, I know. I gotta get, let you get going sometime soon here. Uh, I think I got one or two more here for you. Uh, the purple crew, right? Like, it's not yeah, it's not blue crew anymore. It's it's uh, or it's it's not it purple uh, crew. It was purple crew. Um, a couple of great looks here. Uh, the YZ two fifty. Is that is that mostly in stock trim? Like, is that a stock bike yeah, with your graphics a, on it? Yeah, it was a photo shoot we did for the upcoming year uh would have been um nine uh, uh, uh 94 going this was 95 but the bike was 95 but it was for 90 it was in 94 and for some reason bob star and the guys um who re- did all the advertising for yamaha bob star is absolutely brilliant um fantastic individual to work with one of the most creative minds at a manufacturer that there has ever been we had so much fun like the bald heads the pulling the hair out they're like crazy ads that we did uh, in the early 90s was all bob star but they flew us back to st louis some little podunk motocross track flash like flat track that's the littlest little janky track they flew us all the way out there to shoot these photos on this bike and it's like i remember justin buckaloo was on the mini bike because okay, he, yeah. Was, he, yeah. Yeah, he was a Yamaha, you know, the only amateur team rider at the time. Yeah, yeah number so. 43 on a YZ80? Something, yeah. And you, yeah. You, you just had to get that, you just had to get that that shot where you've seen the bike, right? So Right, right, right. Well, it, it's still, it, honestly, it's a good looking shot with like trees in the background and like every, every color under the sun on you. Those, uh, uh, the Alpine stars with the yellow buckles, those things were iconic. And uh, we talked about the, the monojet uh bike that is the, that that is that bike right there is it not that was 93 i think by then we were running a regular carburetor but mm. that helmet was definitely 92 that was my 92 uh championship helmet so that was one of my favorite ones notice you got that jg logo on there that was for our friend jeff grafton who passed away oh, uh, wow. one of the guys and yeah i even have like a course light sticker on there so yes you do i don't know i don't know that they were, we're breaking all kinds of rules with that. And side note, I think that uh, you know why the, it's okay to drink. You know why it's okay to, as a racer that in your downtime to drink Coors Light, but not other beers. There's no alcohol in it. No, because Coors Light won't slow you down. You remember that's, the advertisement? That's right. How, that, that, you know what? That's you. that. That was true. That 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 was a positioning statement that they made years ago. Yeah, um, so I would have first seen that statement when I was a minor. And then when we all became adults and we're going out to Lake Havasu, yeah. it was always, you got to 
the only beer you can drink is Coors Light because it won't slow you down. Won't slow you down. Well, are, are you even <laughs> 21 in that photo? Yeah, probably Jeff. That probably might Jeff. be 93. Yeah. 93 instead of been 22. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, well, I'm sure uh, uh, Jet enjoyed himself some beverages after his uh, big championship wins. And he sees all the tender age of 20. So. so. Uh, I think this is the last thing I got for you. Uh, Edge Sports. You'd mentioned going from Yamaha's to Kawasaki's. I loved this this Yamaha. I had the the toy dirt bike. The these the, these ones like this of Jeff Emig was one of the first toys I ever had. I no longer have it because I think I played with it a little bit too hard back in the day, and it actually came out of its packaging. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was a great look. Uh, I don't know the full like the, that picture. They kind of I, when I edited this, it cut it off. You're you're sporting uh, double uh, casts uh, in there from a couple of broken wrists, yeah. I believe. At the beginning of uh, would have been the, I guess it would like. Did you have permanent number three? Yeah. So the number eleven photo is the U.S. Open of Supercross, yes. and you win. Year that they had it. Second year they had it. Um, that was after Kawasaki fired me for getting in trouble in Lake Havasu, being an idiot. Um, so. I, I had this Captain America sort of helmet done by Troy. Um, and then that for that race is when we started to put together what would then become my race team. Um, we had Bright, White Brothers on as a sponsor. Um, FMF, FMF was a big sponsor. Enzo was doing the suspension. And we got this little retailer from Ranch Cucamonga, California called the edgesports.com. In the beginning of the of the World Wide Web, they were an online retailer. Okay. Long before it was really like valid and was a, a you could actually sell stuff efficiently. Um, and so the Edge Sports came on. They had a bunch of venture capitalist money coming in. They were developing um, a B two B network that they were literally they had millions of dollars coming in uh, at the time. Our contract was about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Wow! Uh, we had a two-year deal, which was a ton of money, more than what we needed at the time, and won the U.S. Open. Uh, just incredible night, and really validated uh, sort of my my sort of comeback. Um, we decided to build the race team with Tony Strangio and Tim Dixon, my partners, and then I go out and uh, a week before the first Supercross, I break both wrists, make a little mistake, and paid dearly for it and as it would be that was my that, that was it that was that, that was us open was my last win and literally when i was riding a motorcycle better than any time in my entire career i make a mistake and break both wrists and then it was over so wow. that was that. Yeah. yeah um picture on the right is one of my mechanics and one of my oldest and dearest friends billy felt yes um and so that's when uh, after 2000 we ended up end of the motocross season 2000 we switched back to kawasaki again and bruce sternstrom said okay we need a secondary uh 250 team and so we switched all of our colors to red and green and white um the 990 was michael byrne brought him over from australia uh we had casey johnson riding also oh i didn't Um, know that yeah so uh uh, billy was working on burner's bikes uh sean ulikowski he was working on Casey's bikes. Uh, we built an amazing team, all that. And then before Supercross was over, um, our sponsor, the Edge Sports, um, they basically ran out of all, all the VC money that they had coming in. Wow. So, I mean, they were they were $600,000 behind in payments when we finally just had to, had to mm. shut it down. And what people don't understand either is that we were actively working with Steve Astafin, who is Ken Roxon's agent among other significant achievements in his career. Yeah. Uh, Steve Astafin and his company, The Family, the first version, um, he was working on team sponsorship for us. We had the U.S. Army. We had them on the hook, like mm. three-year deal, $3 million a year for three years, $9 wow. million dollar deal in 2001. Wow. Like, like th- we would have had the biggest budget of certainly of any. We would have had the of any privateer team. team. Yeah, yeah. We might not have had the biggest budget of any team, but we had the biggest sponsorship of any team, which was basically all of our budget. 
And, um, and so we were like, okay, I was going to keep funding the team. I was going to keep funding it. And, and, and then we signed us, uh, us army two semis, like the, I mean, we're talking full deal. It was like, this is too easy money. Great. Millions of dollars. Yeah. Come on in. And then they, at the 11th hour, uh, they uh they canceled it wow uh, you know they 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 decided not to go with it and then at that point was when i was like all right i'm done cost me 50 grand or so to actually shut my team down finish up leases and contracts and stuff like that but that year our goal was to have a rider inside of the top 10 in supercross and michael byrne um and 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 thus we all achieved that so um that was kind of the end of the edge sports um and uh, so I kind of wiped my hands of that and went into retirement. Oh, well, uh, yeah. And then you honestly, you're still extremely uh, like you're awesome on a dirt bike for a lot of years after that, man. Yeah. Uh, still kind of like you'd come back at Loretta's every once in a while, whoop up on uh, Josh Hansen. I'm sure he cried about that, cried himself to sleep at the uh, Hurricane Mills um but uh dude this has been so much fun uh like i said we could do five more of these and still have five more else to do um i love that your your memory for this sort of thing uh but it's it's about dinner time for you as it is for me as well so um yeah. i hope you enjoyed this i, ho I hope uh, you'll want to come on again sometime and uh yeah i hope the people that watch slash listen to this really enjoy it yeah well i appreciate everybody watching this i know it's been an hour or so but uh, taking this walk down memory lane. I appreciate it, Brad. I love, uh, you know, um, it's really nice to uh, uh, be appreciated for some of your achievements um, and uh, to be um, a part of motocross history where I was a little kid and a fan uh, long before I was ever a, a professional racer or a champion. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate being recognized. Absolutely. And the next time we'll see you is uh, for World Supercross, yes? Hopefully so. Yep. 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 That's awesome. Well, uh, you have yourself a great rest of your night. Don't hang up the call just yet, but for podcast sake, we're going to cut things off right there.